We and many others have spent much time covering the struggles of healthcare workers during the pandemic, but there's been far less attention to the deaths of doctors, nurses, and other support staff. A major reporting project has been gathering crucial information and looking at the impact of COVID on these frontline workers. William Brangham has more. Judy, throughout the pandemic, the federal government didn't track this kind of data, but a joint project by Kaiser Health News and The Guardian called Lost on the Frontline created its own database to do so. Their teams found that more than 3,600 healthcare workers in the U.S. died during the pandemic's first year. Two-thirds of them were people of color, a third were born outside the United States, and more than half were younger than 60. But the project wasn't simply about data. Reporters also tried to capture something about these individual lives and how their loved ones left behind are now coping. Christina Jewett of Kaiser Health News was one of the lead reporters, and she joins me now. Uh, Christina, great to have you on the news hour. And this is really a terrific piece of journalism you guys have been doing. This is obviously a huge slice of, of a huge number within this one slice of the workforce that, that lost their lives. I mentioned something of their demographics, but who were they in the in the medical setting? Who were these people, broadly speaking? Well, what we found was about 17 percent were doctors, but the bulk were actually workers who, who really spent more time in the room with the patients. It was your patient care technicians. It was your certified nursing assistants. It was your nurses. Um, when you talk to aerosol scientists and they talk about sort of how aerosols accumulate like a, like a cigarette cloud in a room and you think about who's spending most time in that room, that's what we really saw was that those workers who are, who are really close up with the patient for you know, lengths of time were the ones who lost their lives by and large. 3,600 people is an enormous number, but are there particular stories that stand out to you as memorable that you think of as sort of emblematic of this crisis? You know, there's a couple. Um, one is George Nako. When his wife talked to me, it was entirely through tears. And she recounted a 35-year love story that started in their native Albania. They won an immigration lottery to come to the U.S., and it was just your, your classic story of really hard work, which brought him to be a dialysis um, technician at Beaumont Health. And, you know, she knew he was at risk. She said, leave the machine outside, you know, in the hallway, let the nurses handle it. And he wouldn't hear of that. He, you know, took it in the room. He made sure the patients were comfortable. He got them water and, and talked to them. And he got the virus and he died. And this is a man who'd spent um, years telling everyone his son would be a doctor. And when his son had that um, white coat ceremony, um, welcoming him into medical school, his dad, you know, had passed. And that that loss was greatly felt. And so it's stories like that that, that really stick with me of the incredible sacrifices these families have made. There's a man named Walter Beale who you reported on. Can you tell us a little bit about him? Yeah, you know, Walter Beale had a grandson who had a developmental delay, and he worked at a facility for people outside of Chicago who had developmental disabilities called Ludeman. And he really cared for those patients. He would barbecue for them for the birthdays. He would bring them a birthday cake. He bathed them. He, he was a superhero to his wife. That's what she told us. And um, they raised four children together. This was another love story where she recounted, you know, the last moment she saw him, he pulled down his oxygen mask in the ambulance to mouth, I love you. And this is someone who'd been working with gloves, no respiratory protection at all. He had gloves. And he died, and we found in one of our investigations that his death and several others at that facility were not even reported to workplace safety regulators, as were dozens of others. In addition to those types of cases, your reporting also shows that a lot of the reason these people got infected and then died was in part because of our misunderstanding early on about how the coronavirus was spreading. You know, that's right. The guidelines were written early on and they weren't um, changed. Um, and what we saw was there was this notion that the um, intubation was considered an aerosol generating procedure. And the doctors, the staff around for that procedure would get the very best PPE if there's a shortage. And beyond that, people caring for COVID patients could wear a surgical mask. And what we later learned was 
that this is an airborne virus and that a cough, um, just a simple cough, generated actually 10 times more aerosols than an actual intubation procedure. The researchers are sort of looking at that now, and there's some who are saying the um, guidelines that are really in place still all over the world are a, count, a house of cards that has fallen. And that's, um, you know, still debated within the medical field, whether this um, virus requires sort of that higher level of airborne protection, like the N95 mask, or whether it's okay for um, healthcare workers in a surgical mask to be caring for COVID patients. You and your colleagues are closing out this project, partly because these deaths are declining, which is, of course, mm -hmm. good news. Uh, it's also partly because we, we sort of all can see the light at the end of the tunnel with these vaccines, uh, which also is great news. I wonder, though, if you worry that if we move too quickly past this, that we won't really do a very good reckoning of what went wrong that, that cost all these people their lives. That's right. You know, a lot of the research we've seen has come from really elite um, academic medical institutions, and that is just not where we saw people die. So, you know, I think the question of sort of what happened in the third best hospital in a mid-sized metro region, what happened inside a nursing home, you know, why did some um, people not fall ill and, and keep their lives and why did some lose those? I mean, really drilling down into that outside of sort of Boston, outside of Johns Hopkins. So we are better prepared, better able to protect people if this ever happens again, I think. That work, um, to some degree, still needs to be done. All right, Christina Jewett of Kaiser Health News, thank you very much for this uh, tremendous piece of journalism. Well, thank you for having me.